Oh, thank yes. you. Yes, yeah. me Great, too. much appreciated. Handgun stuff. Oh, thanks. So we'll stop at 4.15? Sure. Okay. That gives you 90 minutes. And yeah, yeah. Gives me a the, bit of time before I have to do my next thing. And if we finish before, if we're... I'll talk quickly. Yeah, talk quickly okay, and I'll concise. Talk, Just talk the quickly. Yeah, headlines. Concisely, that's harder. <laughs> but we can talk quickly anyways. Okay. I, if I had to point at the major theme of your work, would it be right to say that I suffer, therefore I am, and that the antidote for suffering or what helps us cope with it is meaning? Yes. Is that a philosophical argument? Say, I mean, no, it's a theological argument. It's a theo is that a, so I'll rephrase, is that a theological argument or a psychological argument? Do we need meaning or do we need a sense of meaning? No, we need meaning. Meaning's real. So a sense of meaning would not do. It's not, it's, it it's can't not be sense. reduced to... No, no. It's an irreducible phenomenon. So we need, we need, we need answers to our questions, yes. basically. That's and right. We don't need to think we have answers to our questions. No, no. There's the, the illusion would not help. No, the illusion will hurt. You know, what I'm trying to suggest to people is that the, the, the pathway to meaning, meaning is the antidote to, to suffering, as far as I can tell. The question is, where is meaning to be found? And my sense is that it's to be found in responsibility. And, and, and not in relationships, because, um, and this is a curious thing, I don't mm -hmm. pretend to have an explanation, but um, say in, in social workers mm -hmm. often get their sense of meaning from, they, they get paid so low in Israel that you can't believe, mm -hmm. but they're addicted to their work. Because when you feel you make a difference in someone's life, that creates a sense of meaning. Sure. So is that responsibility for someone else or is that just a connection? Because parenthood it's gives, both. It's both. It's both. I mean, there is, there, there's more to a relationship than mutual responsibility because there's lots of dynamic processes cementing a relationship, right? But a long-term relationship is definitely the voluntary acceptance of mutual responsibility, right? In sickness and in health, all of that. It's, and it is a formalization of that idea. So we're going to take responsibility for one another. There's a but I, but I want to try and separate. I don't, I'm not yep. sure I can, but to ask if a sense of meaning is generated by a clear philosophical answer or by a belonging to a group. Because sometimes it seems that just belonging creates at least a sense of meaning. Oh, this yeah. Is why oh, people, I, see. I see what you're yeah. saying. Yes, definitely. Well, I would say that this, the, sense of, the, the sense of meaning there or the purpose is implicit. You don't know what it is. But it's in there. It's, it's still, it's like you're a member of a wolf pack. Because the wolf pack is, is doing something. You don't know what it is because you're just a wolf. Well, if you're a person and you're associated with a bunch of other people, you find meaning in it. It doesn't mean you can articulate it. So if you are treating an alcoholic, yeah. what's your way of reconstructing for him or her the connection between meaning and, uh, and, and belonging? Well, we would do that in a very, we do that in a very idiosyncratic way. You know, I, I do a careful analysis of the person's situation. It's like, well, do you have any friends? No. Okay, that's a problem. Zero friends is the wrong number. Okay, so we need to find out how you can reestablish some new social connections. That would be experimental. It's like, well, there are meetup groups online. Well, what are you interested in? Well, I used to be interested in literature. Well, here's a meetup group. Why don't you go to the group and, you know, see, what, see how that goes with regards to their conversation about literature. See if you can make a friend. But if no. you generalize from that, can you see any treatment without a sense of belonging to a social group? I mean, if no, you Not if that's lacking. I mean, some people need less connection than others, but we're intensely social. And a lot of what we do is outsource our sanity. You know, so, so one of the things I've come to realize, and this is an error that I think the psychoanalysts made, is that you don't solve a problem cognitively that you can outsource to the community. Now, your basic goal say with regards to raising a child, is to make the child minimally socially acceptable. And the reason for that is as long as the child is minimally socially acceptable, everyone else will regulate their behavior. Problem solved. Their friends will. You know, like if you have a friend, you, you have to act properly or your friend isn't going to be happy. And if you have five friends, well, even more, you have to tow whatever the line is. You know, and it doesn't mean that you just have to be strictly obedient and nice because if you have friends, they might expect you to be unpredictable and interesting from time to time or daring. Like, it's complicated what people demand from one another. But yeah, you, you, that's all intensely social. There's a continual dialectic between 
individuals and, and between the individual and the group. And all of that has to be optimized. It's not rugged individualism. And, you know, and what I was writing about in 12 Rules and what I talk about in the lectures is it's not... See, individualism is also often associated, say, with the individual pursuit of happiness, let's say. Or self-expression or self-actualization or something like that. That's not or the same as... Well, or authenticity. Well, authenticity, yeah, which, is, which tends to degenerate into something like um, self-expression. Um, I, I was just writing about exactly that. But, you know, what I'm trying to suggest to people is that the, the, the pathway to meaning... Meaning is the antidote to, to suffering, as far as I can tell. The question is, where is meaning to be found? And my sense is that it's to be found in responsibility. If you go from Jung to the behavioral, yeah. so underneath yeah. there, there, is, there are archetypes. They are not exactly yours. They're not generated from within. They echo a well, culture and a nature. Yeah, well, they're, they're an interplay between, between like, like, what would you call it? Let's think about the figure, the great figure of evils, the figure of Satan. Well, what is that? Well, it's cultural. It's a cultural construct, but something that has its autonomous existence in some sense as a, as like as a meme, to use Dawkins' terms, that's extended over thousands and thousands of years. Like it's it's a personality that occupies a transpersonal space, and you can. This is independent of your religious beliefs. It's something you interact with. So you if know you're Mowgli from the uh, Rudyard Kipling's yeah. Jungle Story, is it in English? Jungle Book. Uh, Jungle Book. Yeah. Um, if, if wolves uh, uh, brought you up, you would not have these archetypes, or you, would you have a version of them? Well, if, you'd, still have, you'd still have the version that would be generated as a consequence of your own experience. You'd have the fragments of the archetype anyways, because the archetypes, they have, let's say that they're, they're partly grounded in, 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 in biological experience. Like, there's an archetype of rage. There's an archetype of fear. There's even gods representing those sorts of things. Pan is the god of fear, right? Ares or Mars is the so god with, of without, rage. So without, just completely hypothetically, without culture, yeah. there would be just blind drives or feelings or concepts? What would the archetypes biologically well, speaking I be? Well, I would say you could probably figure that out to some degree by watching a two-year-old. Uh -huh. You know, two-year-olds are, are possessed by one emotional state after another. It's one of the things that makes them quite delightful, you know, because when they're happy, they're just 100% happy. But they cycle. Eh? They'll be happy, and then they'll cry, then they'll be hungry, then they'll be angry. And yeah. then they'll be exhausted, and they'll go to sleep. And then, you know, it's just one, it's, it's the domination by one instinctual system after another. And what happens as a child is enculturated is that those, each of those biological systems has its own viewpoint and its own aims, let's say its own mode of interpreting the world. But that has to be integrated into something approximating a unity that allows all of the drives to work together harmoniously, but also allows them to work together in a landscape that's populated by everyone else who's doing the same thing. And so there's that capability for the unity within. That's what makes us socializable. But it won't manifest itself without the continual interplay with other people. With other people. Right, and, and one of the ways of thinking about that, this is a good way of thinking about it, is that what really happens to children as they become socialized isn't that they inhibit in the Freudian sense. He was wrong about that. You don't inhibit your aggression. You don't inhibit your playfulness. Not, not optimally. I mean, you do sometimes. You channel them? You integrate them. And you integrate them into something approximating a game. And that was the real, that's the real, that's the brilliant, what would you say, that's the brilliant innovation of Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, who, you know, he knew the Freudian corpus, but, he, but he, his, his theory is better. It's not inhibition, it's integration. And so, like, if you have an aggressive child at the age of two, because a number of children are quite aggressive at the age of two, it's part of their temperament, most of them are socialized by the age of four. And what that means is they learn how to play with others, and then their aggression is integrated. You know, like a great athlete, it's like, great athlete is a competitive person that they that aggression is driving them forward like it's a primordial moving force but it's not haphazard and scattered like it's disciplined and, and focused and and it, it it's it's become sublimated maybe is the no it's, it's integrated the right is the right thing it's like it's it's so you it's, harness it to something useful is, yes is that that's right that's right it's it, it it starts to act in the service of a higher order if your attitude towards sexuality is inhibition. That sexuality is going to become a monster. Because, like, you, you can't, 
Here's, a, here's an example. A lot of these systems are rooted in the hypothalamus. And it's a part of the brain that's right above the spinal cord, a very small part of the brain, but a very important part. In fact, if you take a cat, because a lot of this research was done with cats, if you take a female cat and you take out its whole brain, like 90% of its brain, literally, and just leave it with a hypothalamus and a spinal cord, it can do most things that a cat can do, although it's hyper-exploratory, which is pretty bloody weird for a cat with yeah. no brain, right? It's like hy hyper-exploratory. How do you explain that? You can, but... Does it, uh, does it hurt the memory? Oh because yes, that, you can't remember can, anything. So that can explain that, the exploration. That is, well, that's a very I good. Love that's cats. exactly I have two right. Female cats. I won't try that. No, on that's it. exactly right. Like what what memory does is inhibit exploration, and, and, and the rest of the brain is essentially a memory structure that regulates these lower order motivational systems. But but anyways, the connections going up from the lower order systems, pain, anxiety, and then the hypothalamic systems are way thicker than the connections going down. So like you can... So it's a tree-like structure. Mm -hmm, it's a tree-like structure, exactly, with, with some descending inhibition. And the descending inhibition works, but don't mess around with your fundamental biological systems. They kick back, and they have to, because they, you know, they're, they're instinctual systems that are, have been instantiated over the evolutionary process to ensure your survival. Do we need to believe in God because it's useful, or do we absolutely need to believe in God. Yeah, am I making the, the difference mm. clear? That question always stops me. <laughs> Take your time. Um, you need to aim at a transcendent. You need to aim at some, some transcendent ethic. You have to do that. And, and the reason for that is that the transcendent ethic is the way that things are put right. It's not an illusion, and, and, and it's, not, it's not a mere rational construct. It's not an invention. It's none of those things. It's something that you discover, and, and you discover it despite yourself. Like, see, one of, the things, let's, one of the things Nietzsche proposed when he talked about the death of God and the potential for catastrophe that would, be, would emerge as a consequence of that was that people would have to create their own values. We'd have to replace the external valuation scheme that religion provided with something that was psychological, let's say. It's fine. It's a, it's a daring hypothesis. The psychoanalysts, especially Jung, were great students of Nietzsche. And Jung knew why Nietzsche was wrong because of what he learned from Freud. What Jung learned from Freud was that we weren't masters in our own house, that we're beholden to psychological phenomena that are beyond our voluntary control. We have a nature, and that expresses itself within us in ways that we cannot control rationally. It manifests itself as part of reality. It's phenomenological reality, subjective reality, but it's reality nonetheless, like the reality of a dream. You don't invent your dreams, like in a voluntary sense. They manifest themselves in the field of your imagination. But Freud was painfully secular. Freud thought well, God was a, a, a childish disease. Yes, he did. He did. He thought that religion was a grand wish fulfillment. But it's a very shallow criticism, and he should have known better. And that's why Jung and Freud broke. I guess that, that would be one of your most complicated messages, is that your evil side should not be divorced, but rather harnessed well, for it's, good. Yes. So that because blurs, it's not so evil. That blurs the difference between good and evil, in a, in a sense. No, it just, makes it, it just makes it more complicated. It's like, you can't, you can't identify evil with something simple. Oh, it's, aggression is evil. It's like, no, it's not. Fear is evil. No, it's not. Neither is pain. It's not that simple. Whatever evil is, is very complicated. And, and, to, and to attribute to society, for example, or to attribute it to a particular psychological trait, that's just, that's, that's, it's not anywhere near sophisticated enough to come to terms with the problem. So evil is, is, is something that's, 
resentment is, is, is closer to something that's at the core, but even that's not sufficiently complicated. And, and evil is much better construed as a complex personality, which is why that is how it's construed. There's a great figures of evil. Satan is the ultimate figure of evil. Well, why? Because in order to flesh out the concept, you need a character and a personality and a story. You, you can't reduce it to a set of, of, of descriptions, partly because it, it moves. It's like, well, sometimes aggression is evil. Well, yeah, that's true. Sometimes it's not. It's, it's, so so you, that, that's why the personality is a better represent, representative of these sorts of concepts, because a personality is something that's got a certain amount of coherence and identity, but it's also something that's adaptive and flexible in different situations. So, and, and these things are, to think of evil as a personality and to think of good as a personality is much more appropriate than to think of them as tables of rules or something like that or descriptions. Or, or, or instincts. Or instincts, yeah, definitely not instincts. It's like you just can't damn an instinct. You know, it's, it's, not, hel it's, it's not helpful. And there's aggression. It's like, what, you're going to get rid of aggression? It's like, what, you don't like ambition? You don't like purpose? You don't like persistence? So you're not happy with the APA's recent uh, paper I, I, guideline on I am, I am on absolutely men. ashamed to call myself a psychologist in the aftermath of the APA's Let's just say what it is. What exactly did they say? That well, they it said it was guidelines for the treatment of boys and psychological treatment of boys and men. But that isn't what it is. It's and a social justice treatise on how you better think if you're a psychologist, if you don't want to be pursued. That's but, exactly what it is. But what they actually said was that traditional masculinity mm -hmm. was harmful. And yep. one of the arguments they, they said made for two for reasons, two yeah. reasons. Compromised the mental health of boys and men and presented a social danger. And it's an absolute bloody lie. And here's, here's how you know. It's very straightforward. Biggest risk factor for long-term delinquency, antisocial behavior, and violent criminality. In boys Fatherlessness. Girls. Fatherlessness. Right, okay, so let's, let's walk through it. Okay, so the, the idea is that boys are socialized to be pathologically masculine by men. We're assuming they're fathers. Okay, so then why is it in families with no fathers that everything falls apart? And then, like, no one disputes that that's the case. They don't cover that in that damn article. So, and then they, you know, they also assume that aggression is socialized. It's like, no, aggression, aggression is innate. Peacefulness is socialized. And how is it socialized? Well, men, for example, one of the things that men do with their young boys is wrestle with them. They rough and tumble play with them. Well, what is that? Well, it's aggression. It's like, no, it's not. It's play. And what do you do when you're rough and tumble playing? It's like you show the boy and the girl, too, because it happens with girls, how much they can exert themselves physically and still have the game continue. What hurts and what doesn't? How far someone else can be pushed? How much feinting and, and, and tactical maneuvering you can do? How much you can be extended? How you can trust if you're thrown in the air? Like these things are fundamentally important. And men do a lot of that. And they regulate the, it's such, that, that article is just, it's absolutely scandalous what they've done. They've, I, they've inverted the, it's not even, it's not even wrong. It's anti-truth. It's worse than wrong. I'll play devil, devil's advocate, at, at, at least in part. There was a book, I think, in the 80s by uh, David Gilmore, not the one from the Pink Floyd, uh, Manhood in the Making, mm -hmm. where he said that the, the common denominator in most cultures, not all, is that maleness is associated with suppression of emotions. He had a an, uh, Nancy Kodorov kind of argument for the, psycho, the psychoanalytic side, but he said, if you look at cultures, Manhood is a test of endurance almost everywhere. So like they would, in some cultures he surveyed, they would torture you, yeah. and if you flinched, you lose your manhood. Yeah, right. So right. Is that, would you consider that part of masculinity harmful? Well, t it depends on the degree to which it trains you to endure. It's like, look, oh, there's all but these... But would you say it's defined by suppression of feelings? Because that's not, what they not say. If it's, not if it's done in a sophisticated manner. It's, it's defined by the, by the, what would you call... By the, by, the, by the sophisticated integration of the emotions. It's like, there's gonna be, you're gonna be facing hard things, man, in your life. It's like, you're gonna break down. And I mean, look, I'm saying this as a very emotional male, right? Like my proclivity to tears has been overwhelming all my life. And so, so, uh, so. Sometimes well, in your talks. Yes, yes. And, 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 and so, so I'm saying that, knowing that about myself. What's wrong with the ability to endure? 
Like lots of times endurance is what you have. When things are really going badly, and they will, you have the ability to put one goddamn foot in front of the other. And, like, and, and maybe you're even manifesting negative emotion about it, but that doesn't mean you stop. You don't stop. And, and that's not just a cardinal element of masculinity, although it is in the symbolic sense. It's a cardinal aspect of the development of a forthright character. You want your children to be able to endure. We're so naive. It's like, no, you want them to be happy. It's like, yeah, fine, but what about when they're not happy? What, what, about when, what about when they have a sick child? What about when someone's dying? You know, like, what? well, they should be happy. It's like, God, it's, it's, it's thin gruel. It's a leaky boat. And so you train, you train stalwart individuals to endure. Now, can that go too far? Well, obviously, you know, I mean, every culture can degenerate into into cruel tyranny, you know, and they can, and they can and engage in sadistic rituals that have this justification to, 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 to train endurance. But what's wrong with endurance? And to inhibit emotion isn't, it's not to inhibit emotion precisely, it's to put things in their proper place. When you, when you have people relying on you, including yourself, but when you have people relying on you, you don't get to quit. People yeah. die if you quit. They suffer if you quit. It's like if you're a parent, especially. If, yes, of course. And you know, and this this is this is why I like the Christian metaphor, at least in part. It's like pick up your bloody cross and walk up the hill. You know, and uh, of course, there's suffering and catastrophe associated with that. It doesn't mean that men should pretend that they don't have emotions, but you know, that's so obvious that it hardly needs to be discussed. I want to end uh, on, a, on a, a personal note again and, and ask you if you to, to, to remember one I moment think the of people who wrote I think the people who wrote that article are reprehensibly weak and deceitful. The, the APA article? Yes, yes. And I, I think that they justify their reprehensible weakness by an all-out assault on the idea of strength and competence and that they clothe that in virtue. It's, it's a... It's a, it's, it's a it's a nauseating document. So I'll, I'll end with a question about you as a father. Do you, do you have moments that you, you specifically uh, cherish of your relations with your... your the whole with your time. Uh, any specific anecdote, any specific thing that stands out for you? Any specifically hard, uh, hard moment? Oh, God, it's been brutal. My daughter was unbelievably ill for, for like decades. It's been brutal. She hasn't lost her sense of humor. Through no, man, she's tough. Yeah, well, we taught her too, you know, right from the beginning. You can lose your body and you can lose your soul. And she lost her body, but she didn't lose her soul. And part of the reason for that was we tried to encourage her never, never, never to use her illness as an excuse because you blur the line. You know, it's like maybe you can't do something and that's, that's not good. You can't do it. It's something that someone else can do. But maybe one day you use the fact that you're suffering and you're ill as an excuse not to do something that you should have done. And then you've opened a little door you know, you've opened the door to a place you do not want to go. And you do that a hundred times and you no longer know where the illness stops. And then you're done. You're done. And so I think she didn't do that. And now she's healthy. You know, it's like she's completely recovered by all appearances. She was just in Switzerland, which is part of the reason I'm here to have. She had an ankle replacement when she was a kid and it didn't go quite well. Her bones weren't strong enough to hold the artificial ankle in place properly and so we came here because the originator of the artificial joint practices here and he's done a superb job by all appearances they screwed the tibia to the fibia to make the leg stronger and fix the joint up and now she seems to have full range of motion which is a complete bloody miracle and you know and she seems to have emerged out of this um, well unscathed would be pushing it because you shouldn't be unscathed by that sort of experience but She's tough as a bloody boot, that girl, and, and she has a great sense of humor, and she's really enthusiastic about being alive. And so, 
So that's really something, but a little victimization in there, that wouldn't have gone good. You don't want that when, 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 when trouble emerges. You don't want that. Yeah. So we'll wish Michaela a speedy recovery, and thank you so much for this conversation. You bet. Thank you. Very nice talking with you.